Welcome to the Conspiracy Theory Iceberg, a series that takes you deep into a world where the line between fact and fiction blurs, and the truth is often stranger than fiction. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, prepare to question everything you thought you knew. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe and share this video with your co-conspirators. The concept of reality being a simulation, often referred to as the simulation hypothesis, has garnered significant attention in both philosophical discourse and popular culture. This theory suggests that what we perceive as reality might in fact be an artificial simulation, possibly run by an advanced civilization. The notion is deeply rooted in both contemporary technology and long-standing philosophical inquiries about the nature of existence. One of the most prominent proponents of the simulation hypothesis is philosopher Nick Bostrom. In his seminal 2003 paper, Bostrom argues that at least one of the following propositions is likely true. 1. Civilizations like ours typically do not reach a level of technological maturity capable of creating simulated realities. 2. If they do reach such a level, they are unlikely to produce a significant number of simulations. Or 3. We are almost certainly living in a simulation. Bostrom's trilemma is predicated on the assumption that future civilizations with vastly superior computing power might run numerous simulations of their ancestors, thus making it statistically probable that we are among those simulations rather than the original beings. Another related concept is that of hyperreality, introduced by the philosopher Jean Baudrillard. Hyperreality refers to a condition in which the distinction between reality and simulation blurs leading to a situation where simulated experiences are perceived as more real than reality itself. This concept is crucial in understanding the cultural implications of the simulation hypothesis, as it suggests that in a hyper-real world, the lines between the real and the simulated are not just blurred, but may be entirely erased. Baudrillard's theory implies that in such a world, people might not only live in a simulation, but also prefer the simulated experiences over real ones, finding fulfillment in artificial constructs. The simulation hypothesis also finds parallels in the experience machine thought experiment proposed by philosopher Robert Nozick. Nozick's scenario asks whether people would choose to plug into a machine that could provide them with any experience they desired, indistinguishable from reality. This thought experiment resonates with modern-day concerns about virtual reality and its potential to replace actual experiences with digital ones. The possibility that we might already be living in a simulation has profound implications for our understanding of existence, morality, and the future of humanity. If our reality is indeed a simulation, questions arise about the nature of our creators, their intentions, and the ethical considerations of creating simulated beings capable of suffering and joy. The conspiracy theory that the idea of reality being a simulation is being actively suppressed by elites has gained traction in some circles. Proponents of this theory argue that powerful individuals and organizations have a vested interest in keeping the general public unaware of the true nature of reality. They suggest that revealing the possibility that we live in a simulation could undermine the current social order, destabilize religious beliefs, and challenge the authority of those in power. One argument supporting this conspiracy is the notion that elites fear the loss of control. If people were to widely accept that reality is a simulation, it could lead to existential crises and a questioning of the systems of governance economics, and religion. This theory posits that the elites use their influence over media, education, and technology to suppress or discredit discussions about the simulation hypothesis. By controlling the narrative, they can prevent people from exploring ideas that might lead to social upheaval. Another aspect of the conspiracy centers around the idea that technological advancements which could potentially expose the simulation, 
are being deliberately limited or misdirected. According to this line of thought, breakthroughs in quantum computing, artificial intelligence, or other fields that might reveal the true nature of reality are either being slowed down or used to reinforce the illusion. This control over technological progress is seen as a way to keep humanity trapped within the simulation without realizing it. Furthermore, the theory suggests that when individuals or groups begin to approach the truth, they are met with censorship, ridicule, or even threats. This, proponents argue, is evidence of a coordinated effort to keep the masses ignorant of their simulated existence. However, there's also the conspiracy theory that the simulation hypothesis is a psyop designed to demoralize the populace. This theory is rooted in the belief that this idea is being deliberately propagated to create a sense of hopelessness and existential dread. Proponents of this theory argue that promoting the notion that reality itself may be an artificial construct potentially benefits those wishing to maintain the status quo. Thus, if the populace are demoralized, this makes them easier to control and thus easier to rule. Also, if you're a fan of the work of Nick Bostrom, his ideas will be making another appearance later in this video, so stay tuned. The conspiracy theory around the term conspiracy theorist. The term conspiracy theory is relatively recent, first appearing in its modern sense around the mid 20th century. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the phrase was first used during the 20th century to describe unverified theories that attribute significant events to secret plots by powerful entities. The term gained particular prominence during the Cold War, a period marked by intense suspicion and speculation, as well as outright paranoia. Scholars suggest that the widespread usage of the term conspiracy theory began to increase following the demise of President John F. Kennedy in 1963. As various alternative explanations for the events surrounding JFK emerged, the media and official narratives sought to discredit these accounts by labeling them as conspiracy theories. A significant and often cited point in the history of the term conspiracy theory involves the CIA. Some researchers and theorists claim that the CIA deliberately popularized the term in the 1960s to discredit and undermine critics of the Warren Commission's findings. These critics, who questioned the lone gunman theory, were labeled as fringe conspiracy theorists, a term that increasingly carried a pejorative connotation. This CIA initiative is often linked to a memo known as CIA Document 135960, which outlined strategies for countering conspiracy theories by associating them with irrationality and paranoia. The document recommended using the term conspiracy theory to discredit critics by questioning their motives and character, thereby shifting the focus from the content of their arguments to their credibility. This strategy appears to have been effective as the term soon became a rhetorical tool used to marginalize dissent and reinforce official narratives. Notably, despite the CIA document being readily available and for you to see on the screen at the moment, many official sources claim that this is a quote-unquote alleged document. Further, while other sources acknowledge the existence of the document, they claim that there is no proof that the CIA actually took steps to implement this plan. However, this ignores the fact that this was during the time which Operation Mockingbird was in full effect, and thus there was a clear vector for the spread of the term. The pejorative use of conspiracy theory has been explored extensively in academic literature in recent years, given the power infused in the term by the CIA. Scholars argue that labeling an idea as a conspiracy theory often serves to delegitimize it without engaging with the substantive evidence or arguments presented. This dismissive attitude suggests that conspiracy theories are not just incorrect or unfounded, but inherently irrational, the product of a disturbed or paranoid mind. Further critics of the CIA's formulation of this term note that it's universally accepted 
that secretive actions have repeatedly and consistently been taken by those in power throughout history. Further yet, certain proven conspiracies which were once dismissed under the conspiracy theory label were proven to be true beyond a shadow of a doubt. One needs only to look at the Watergate scandal or MK Ultra for such cases that were immediately dismissed as being, quote, conspiracy theories. The term conspiracy theory may be one that the Glowies thought up to discredit people who don't take information at face value and question official narratives. However, the phrase has since been reappropriated by the same people the CIA had once sought to delegitimize and discredit. Today, many conspiracy theorists wear the term as a badge of pride rather than as a scarlet letter. The Nobody Unlike many conspiracy theories that focus on specific events or figures, the nobody theory is centered around a mysterious, nameless individual referred to as the nobody. According to the theory, the nobody is an enlightened being who possesses deep, almost godlike wisdom and is aware of the true nature of reality. He is believed to be working behind the scenes to bring about significant changes in the world although his exact motivations and methods are deliberately obscured. Proponents suggest that the nobody could be absolutely anyone, and theories suggest this figure is much more likely to be the individual you would least expect than otherwise. This figure is seen as both a savior and a disruptor, someone who will challenge the existing power structures, but also possess a moral compass that is beyond human understanding. One of the key reasons for the appeal of the nobody conspiracy theory lies in its open-ended nature. Unlike more rigid conspiracy theories, which tend to provide a clear narrative with identifiable villains and heroes, the nobody theory is vague and flexible. The anonymity and ambiguity of the nobody potentially resonates with the anonymous culture of the site and the board, where anonymity is a core principle. The structure of the theory relies heavily on cryptic posts and discussions, often laden with references to philosophy, esotericism, and occultism. The theory's roots also mean that it is often presented with a mix of irony and sincerity, making it difficult to discern whether proponents truly believe in the theory or are engaging in a form of modern myth-making. The nobody theory remains largely unknown outside the X board at present. Mike Baker, a quote unquote former CIA covert operations officer, has gained significant attention as the most common recurring guest on the Joe Rogan experience. For those unaware, this podcast is thought to be the largest and most influential podcast in the world by a substantial margin. As of my recording this, he has been on the podcast a total of 19 times, including in a podcast released earlier this week. Over numerous appearances, Baker has shared his insights on global security, intelligence operations, and geopolitical events. The regularity of his appearances have also sparked significant debate as to what exactly his role is. On Joe Rogan's podcast, Baker often discusses sensitive topics, such as espionage, data privacy, and international conflicts, through the lens of his CIA experience. His straightforward manner and apparent deep knowledge of these subjects have earned him the ability to present as a credible expert. Conspiracy theorists argue that Baker's appearances on the Joe Rogan experience serve a dual purpose. First, to legitimize his role as an authority on global affairs, and second, and more importantly, to subtly propagate the CIA's viewpoints on various issues to millions of listeners worldwide. His critics note that Baker appears to maintain an open mind about conspiracy theories, and may admit some elements of some theories are plausible. However, despite this, his critics note that he virtually always comes back to repeating the official stance on issues affected by conspiracy theories. Second, there is the theory that Mike Baker, while presenting himself as, quote, formerly 
of the CIA is in fact still an active agent on a clandestine basis. In this role, it is theorized that Baker has been assigned as Joe Rogan's handler. This theory suggests he exerts both overt and subtle influence over Rogan to shape the content and direction of his podcast. While this theory remains speculative and lacks concrete evidence, it persists among those who believe that once you're glowing, you always glow. The Lesser Key of Solomon is a highly influential grimoire on demonology and the occult compiled in the mid-17th century from various sources dating back at least several centuries earlier. This text, attributed to King Solomon, is a seminal work in Western esotericism and is primarily concerned with the summoning and control of spirits, both demonic and angelic. The Lesser Key of Solomon is rooted in a complex tradition of medieval and Renaissance magic, and possibly even magical traditions stretching back to antiquity. While it is traditionally attributed to King Solomon, further additions were noted to have been made through incorporation of earlier grimoires, mysticism, demonology, and astrology. The Lesser Key of Solomon is divided into five distinct books, each dealing with different aspects of magic and spirit conjuration. The first and most well-known section, Ars Goetia, details the 72 demons that King Solomon supposedly bound and controlled. This section provides descriptions of each demon, their powers, their ranks, and how they can be summoned. The demons listed include well-known figures like Baal, Paimon, and Asmodeus. The Ars Thurgia Goetia deals with a different class of spirits, known as aerial spirits, and details complex rituals for summoning and controlling them. Unlike the demons of the Ars Godia, these spirits are more ambiguous and are not necessarily evil. The spirits in this section are tied to specific directions on the compass, with various emperors, dukes, and princes ruling over them. The Ars Paulina is divided into two distinct parts. The first part deals with the 24 angels of the hours of the day, while the second part addresses the angels ruling over the degrees of the zodiac. It claims to be based on the teachings of Paul the Apostle and esoteric traditions developed by his followers in the millennia that followed. The Ars Almadel focuses on the summoning of angelic beings associated with specific regions of the heavens. This book also describes the creation of a magical wax tablet, known as the Almadel, which is used to communicate with these angels. The final section, the Ars Notoria, is a collection of prayers and meditations designed to enhance the magician's memory and understanding. Unlike the other books, which focus on the summoning of spirits, the Ars Notoria is more concerned with the development of the practitioner's intellectual and spiritual abilities. Notably, this section has been omitted from many collections of this grimoire, which some conspiracy theorists speculate indicates a special power associated with this esoteric knowledge. The Lesser Key of Solomon has had a profound impact on the development of Western esotericism. It was notably edited and published by Aleister Crowley in the early 20th century. His edition, known as the Goetia, the Lesser Key of Solomon the King, helped to popularize the text among modern occultists and brought it to a wider audience. Crowley added his interpretations and modifications to the text, blending it with his own theories of magic and psychology. Suppression of Esoteric Knowledge The idea that esoteric knowledge is actively suppressed by powerful entities forms a cornerstone of numerous conspiracy theories. Proponents of this belief argue that hidden truths, ranging from spiritual and mystical wisdom to advanced scientific and technological knowledge, are deliberately kept from the public. This is generally purported to be for the purposes of maintaining control over both individuals and over societal structures generally. Esoteric knowledge, by its very definition, refers to information that is intended to be accessible 
only to a select group of individuals. Historically, this type of knowledge has been associated with secret societies, such as the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, and other secret societies. These groups are often depicted as custodians of ancient wisdom, which they purportedly safeguard from the general populace. The term esoteric itself is rooted in a Greek word that means belonging to an inner circle and originally referred to teachings meant only for a limited audience. Over centuries, this concept evolved to encompass a wide range of spiritual, philosophical, and occult traditions that lie outside mainstream religious practices. The narrative of esoteric knowledge being suppressed can be traced back to the tension between institutionalized religion and alternative spiritualities, particularly during the Enlightenment and Renaissance periods. During these times, Western esotericism began to crystallize as a distinct field of thought that was often at odds with Christian orthodoxies. The Rosicrucians, for example, emerged in the early 17th century with a promise of hidden wisdom that could transform society, yet their teachings were seen as heretical and dangerous. This tension between mainstream religious or scientific thought and esoteric traditions created fertile ground for conspiracy theories. Theories often suggest that religious authorities, governments, and later scientific establishments have systematically suppressed esoteric teachings to prevent the masses from accessing powerful knowledge. In contemporary conspiracy culture, the notion of suppressed esoteric knowledge often centers on secret societies like the Illuminati. These secret societies are speculated to hoard advanced knowledge in areas ranging from science and technology to the manipulation of human consciousness. The belief is that this knowledge could revolutionize humanity's understanding of the universe and ourselves, but would also destabilize the control that these secretive groups have over the global population. Beyond the spiritual and mystical realms, Conspiracy theories also assert that revolutionary scientific discoveries and technological advancements have been deliberately kept secret. This idea is often tied to the suppression of technologies such as free energy devices. The free energy suppression theory suggests that devices like perpetual motion machines or advanced propulsion systems have been developed but are concealed to maintain the status quo. The belief that esoteric knowledge is suppressed by powerful elites is a deeply ingrained element of many conspiracy theories. Terry Davis and Temple OS. Temple OS is an operating system that stands out not just for its unique technical aspects, but also for its creator, Terry Davis. Davis was a highly talented yet deeply troubled programmer who developed Temple OS single-handedly over the span of a decade. Terry Davis was born on December 15, 1969, in West Allis, Wisconsin. He showed an early aptitude for computers and programming as a teenager. Davis pursued a degree in electrical engineering at Arizona State University and worked for several years as a programmer in Silicon Valley. However, his promising career was derailed in the mid-1990s when he began to experience symptoms of mental illness eventually being diagnosed with schizophrenia in 1996. In 2003, Davis started working on what would become Temple OS. He believed he was receiving direct instructions from God to build an operating system that would be a modern-day third temple, a place where people could commune with the divine. Davis envisioned Temple OS as a tool for this sacred purpose, incorporating numerous biblical references and elements. The operating system was initially known as J Operating System, then Lose Those, and later Sparrow OS, before finally being named Temple OS in 2013. Temple OS is distinctive for its use of a programming language created by Davis called Holy C. Also, quick interjection here. Holy C for a programming language and a Christian-themed operating system is one of the most brilliant puns I've ever heard. This language, 
along with the operating system, reflects Davis's profound technical skills and his unconventional approach to software development. The system features a 640 by 480 resolution with 16 colors, which Davis claimed were specified by God. Temple OS includes a variety of programs, such as games and a flight simulator, all inspired by biblical themes. Throughout the development of Temple OS, Davis struggled immensely with his mental health. His schizophrenia led to numerous hospitalizations and episodes of psychosis. Davis's online presence often reflected his troubled state of mind, with many of his communications being incoherent or marked by paranoia and conspiracy theories. Despite these challenges when discussing technical topics, Davis often remained lucid and displayed remarkable insight and expertise, despite losing touch with reality more generally. Temple OS received a mix of curiosity and admiration from the tech community. Some praised the operating system as a testament to Davis's dedication and technical prowess, while others viewed it as a fascinating, albeit impractical, curiosity. Further in general culture, his coinage of the term glowy for government agents has come to be widely understood to refer to federal agents. Terry Davis's life came to a tragic end on August 11, 2018, when he was struck and killed by a train. The tale of the man from Tared takes place in July 1954 at Tokyo's Haneda Airport, where a man allegedly arrived with a passport from a country named Tared. For those not incredibly familiar with the geography of the 1950s, this is a nation that does not exist on any known map and never has at any point. The mysterious man claimed that Torred was located between France and Spain, precisely where Andorra is situated. Despite this assertion, when he was shown a map, he became agitated, insisting that his country had existed for over a thousand years. The man also carried documentation, including a passport and currency, that supported his claims of being from Torred, all of which puzzled the Japanese authorities. They detained him in a hotel room under guard while they conducted further investigations. However, the next morning, the man had vanished without a trace, leaving no sign of how he might have escaped, especially given that the room had no balcony and was several floors up. Some suggest that the man was a traveler from a parallel dimension, where Torrid is a real country, and that he somehow crossed over into our reality before slipping back into his own. Despite the mysterious allure of the story, many researchers believe it may be rooted in a much more mundane event involving a man named John Allen Kuchar Zegris. In 1960, Zegris was arrested in Japan after presenting a forged passport from a fictional country called Torrid. His passport was written in an unknown language, and Zegris claimed to be an intelligence agent, traveling on orders from an Arab-related organization. The story of the man from Torred may have emerged from this real incident, later morphing into the legend it is today due to the power of retelling and the human tendency to add layers of mystery to events. In 1946, a series of mysterious aerial phenomena known as the ghost rockets were reported predominantly over Sweden. The first reports emerged in February 1946 from Finland and soon spread to Sweden and Norway. The sightings described elongated rocket-like objects, sometimes leaving behind trails of smoke and occasionally exhibiting erratic movements or crashing into lakes. By the end of 1946, over 2,000 sightings had been recorded, with a peak occurring in mid-August during the Perseid meteor shower. Initially, many speculated that the ghost rockets were Soviet tests of captured German V-2 rocket technology. This theory was fueled by the geopolitical tension of the time and the fact that the Soviets had taken over the Peenemünde rocket base in Germany. However, historical records released after the Soviet Union's dissolution indicated that no V-2 launches were conducted by the Soviets in 1946. 
likely debunking this theory. The Swedish military took the sighting seriously, launching investigations and even employing radar tracking to determine the object's origins. Despite extensive efforts, including naval searches of lakes where the objects reportedly crashed, no conclusive evidence was found. One notable investigation involved a search in Lake Kolmjarva, where divers discovered a crater, but no remnants of a rocket. Theories about the nature of the ghost rockets abound. Some scientists, such as those from the Swedish Nobel laureate Dr. Manna Siegbahn, suggested that many of the sightings could be explained by natural phenomena like meteors. This theory gained traction, particularly since the peak of the sightings coincided with a major meteor shower. Nonetheless, the persistence and detailed nature of many reports kept the mystery alive. There were also claims of extraterrestrial origins. A declassified U.S. Air Force document from 1948 revealed that some military officials believed the ghost rockets could be evidence of a technology far beyond what was known on Earth at the time. This document mentioned an incident where a UFO was observed over Nubiburg Air Base for about 30 minutes, adding to the speculative and mysterious nature of the phenomena. The ghost rockets were not confined to Scandinavia. Similar objects were reported in Greece, Portugal, Belgium, and Northern Italy, leading to further international investigations. In Greece, a research team concluded that the objects were not missiles, but was stopped from further inquiry by higher authorities, allegedly due to the involvement of foreign officials. Despite numerous theories and extensive investigations, the ghost rockets remain unexplained. The phenomenon gradually faded from the headlines as newer UFO sightings, and the Roswell incident ended up overshadowing this event soon after. Last Thursdayism is a philosophical hypothesis that postulates the universe was created last Thursday, complete with all memories, historical records, fossils, and signs of age. Despite its seemingly absurd premise, Last Thursdayism serves as a provocative commentary on the nature of evidence, belief, and the limits of scientific inquiry. The concept of Last Thursdayism is closely related to the Omphalos hypothesis, proposed by Philip Henry Gasse in 1857. He argued that God created the earth with the appearance of age as a means to test the faith of individuals. For example, Adam would have been created with a navel, trees with rings, and rocks with fossils, all of which imply a history that never actually occurred. This theory was intended to reconcile the biblical account of creation with then significantly expanding geological evidence of an ancient earth. However, it was criticized by both theologians and scientists for suggesting that God would create a world filled with false evidence effectively making him a deceiver. The idea of Last Thursdayism takes Gauss's hypothesis to an extreme, proposing that the entire universe, along with all its apparent history, could have been created last Thursday. This idea highlights the challenge of disproving such claims, since any evidence against it could be dismissed as part of the created illusion. At its core, Last Thursdayism questions the reliability of memory and evidence. It shares conceptual space with other skeptical hypotheses, such as Bertrand Russell's five-minute hypothesis. Russell suggested that the universe could have been created five minutes ago, with all memories and records intact, and there would be no way to disprove it. Similarly, Last Thursdayism posits that we could all be living in a universe that was created just last Thursday, with our memories of a longer past being fabricated as part of that creation. This leads to the broader philosophical question of solipsism and extreme versions of skepticism. If all our perceptions, memories, and evidence can be fabricated, how can we know anything for certain? In 1968, during the height of the Cold War, the Soviet submarine K-129 embarked on a mission that would lead to one of the most intriguing maritime mysteries of the era. K-129 
K-129 was a Golf II class ballistic missile submarine equipped with three ballistic missiles and powered by diesel electric engines. It belonged to the Soviet Pacific Fleet and was stationed at the Rybachi Naval Base on the Kamchatka Peninsula. K-129 left its base in February 1968 for a routine patrol mission in the Pacific Ocean. However, the submarine never completed its mission and was declared missing in March 1968. The exact reasons behind its sinking remain undisclosed by both Soviet and American sources, contributing to the enigma surrounding its disappearance. The Soviets launched an extensive search but failed to locate the submarine due to the lack of advanced underwater detection technology. Unbeknownst to the Soviets, the U.S. had identified the location of K-129 using underwater sonar technology from the sound surveillance system, better known as SOSIS. The wreck was found approximately 1,600 miles northwest of Hawaii at a depth of around 16,000 feet. This discovery presented the U.S. with a significant intelligence gathering opportunity given the submarine's nuclear capabilities and cryptographic equipment. The CIA then embarked on a top-secret mission to recover the submarine, codenamed Project Azorian. To achieve this, the CIA contracted Global Marine Development Inc. to design and build a specialized ship, the Hughes Glomar Explorer. The vessel was ostensibly constructed for deep-sea mining. A cover story was invented utilizing billionaire Howard Hughes, who lent his name to the project despite having no direct involvement. In July 1974, the Hughes Glomar Explorer arrived at the recovery site and began the clandestine operation to lift K-129 from the ocean floor. The ship employed a large mechanical claw designed to grasp and lift the submarine. However, during the recovery, a part of the submarine broke off and sank back to the ocean floor. Despite this setback, the crew managed to recover a portion of the submarine, which included the remains of six Soviet sailors. These sailors were given a proper burial at sea, and the event was later documented and presented to the Russian government in 1992. The operation remained a closely guarded secret until February 1975, when the Los Angeles Times exposed Project Azorian, revealing details of the CIA's mission. This disclosure caused a significant stir, and subsequent attempts to recover the remaining parts of K-129 were abandoned to avoid escalating tensions with the Soviet Union. Project Azorian stands out as a remarkable example of Cold War ingenuity and the lengths to which intelligence agencies would go to gain an advantage over their adversaries. Over the years, Various theories and conspiracy theories have emerged regarding the cause of K-129's sinking. Some suggest it was due to a mechanical failure or an onboard explosion. Others speculate about a possible collision with a U.S. submarine, although there is no concrete evidence to support this claim. Others suggest that it was intentionally targeted by the Americans and that Project Azorian was already planned in advance. Paul Vigue, born in October 1964 in Croydon, was a British computer consultant known for his expertise in computer software and his contributions to the study of UFOs and crop circles. His career in computing began early, with a keen interest sparked during his school years when he used early computers. He would go on to make a variety of contributions towards the development of RISC OS a lesser known but still quite widely used operating system. Vigay's fascination with the unexplained extended beyond his computing endeavors. He was deeply involved in UFO research and became a prominent figure in the crop circle community from the early 1990s. His research contributed to the 2002 film Signs, as well as numerous documentaries. Vigay's work in this field earned him a reputation as a leading expert, blending his technical skills with a passion for the paranormal. On February 20th, 2009, Vigay's body was found off Portsmouth Beach, leading to widespread shock in the UFO community, 
as well as significant speculation. The previous night, he had been reported missing after a series of emotional events involving his girlfriend, Andrea Smith. The couple had recently broken up, and Vigay left a note saying, I love you, along with his passwords. Despite this, the coroner ruled the circumstances of his passing a mystery, citing a lack of evidence to determine whether it was an accident or intentional. This ruling left many questions unanswered, particularly given the absence of a note, significant alcohol or substance consumption, or any signs of a struggle. Speculation about the true nature of Vigay's demise continues to this day. Some theories suggest he may have been overwhelmed by personal and financial pressures. Others point to the possibility of foul play, given his involvement in controversial fields of study. However, no definitive evidence has emerged to support any single theory, and the mystery remains a topic of intrigue within the communities he was part of. An info hazard or information hazard is a concept that refers to the risk that arises from the dissemination of true information. The idea challenges the commonly held belief in the inherent value of free and open information sharing by suggesting that some types of information can be so dangerous that their dissemination should be restricted. Much like the simulation hypothesis in its most fleshed out form, the term info hazard was first coined by philosopher Nick Bostrom Bostrom defines an info hazard as, quote, a risk that arises from the dissemination of true information that may cause harm or enable some agent to cause harm. Unlike misinformation or disinformation, which involve false or misleading information, an info hazard involves true information that, if widely known, could result in significant negative consequences. This concept is deeply intertwined with concerns about information sensitivity and the potential consequences of knowledge that might be too dangerous for the general public. Bostrom categorizes info hazards into several types, each posing unique risks. The two primary categories are adversarial hazards and inadvertent hazards. Adversarial hazards occur when information is intentionally used by bad actors to cause harm. For instance, the publication of detailed instructions for creating a thermonuclear weapon would be considered an adversarial hazard. The knowledge itself is not inherently harmful, but in the hands of someone with malicious intent, it could lead to catastrophic outcomes. Inadvertent hazards involve situations where harm results not from malicious intent but from the unintended consequences of possessing certain information. For example, knowledge of certain medical information might lead to widespread panic or harmful behaviors if misunderstood or misapplied by the general public. Within these broad categories, Bostrom identifies several subtypes, including data hazards such as the DNA sequence of an infectious disease, idea hazards, which are concepts that could be harmful if actualized, such as the theoretical underpinnings of a novel weapon, and quote, knowing too much hazards, which are situations where simply possessing certain knowledge could put an individual at risk, such as a whistleblower in possession of classified information. The concept of info hazards raises significant ethical and practical questions particularly regarding the balance between freedom of information and the potential need to suppress dangerous knowledge. In democratic societies, the principle of freedom of information is held as a fundamental right. However, the existence of info hazards, if accepted as a concept, suggests that there may be cases where it is ethical or even necessary to limit access to certain information to prevent harm. One of the main ethical dilemmas involves determining who should have the authority to classify information as hazardous and decide whether to restrict its dissemination. This power, if misused, could lead to censorship or the suppression of information 
that is vital for public discourse and progress. For instance, during a health crisis, the withholding of critical information about a disease could prevent panic, but also hinder effective public response and transparency. Moreover, the challenge of controlling info hazards is compounded by the global and decentralized nature of information in the digital age. The internet allows for the rapid and widespread dissemination of information, making it difficult to contain once it is released. This raises concerns about how to effectively manage and mitigate info hazards without infringing on personal freedoms and the free exchange of ideas. The notion that info hazards could be a psyop suggests that the concept itself could be used to manipulate or control public perception and behavior. From this perspective, the concept of info hazards might be leveraged to justify the suppression of information by framing it as too dangerous for public consumption. By labeling certain types of knowledge as info hazards, authorities could potentially control the narrative and prevent the dissemination of information that might challenge their power or provoke dissent. This could be seen as a means of stifling freedom of speech and suppressing dissent under the guise of protecting public safety. In this formulation, info hazards are simply another way for the powers that be to maintain the status quo and control the narrative. The danger of the concept of info hazards should be readily apparent. To take a widely known example, during the American Revolutionary Period, the ideas espoused by the revolutionaries would have likely been classified as info hazards by the British government. Ideas such as independence, self-governance, and the rejection of monarchical authority were seen as an obscenity. These ideas posed a significant threat to British control over the American colonies and had the potential to inspire rebellion, not only in America, but also in other parts of the British Empire. The British Crown would have viewed these revolutionary concepts as dangerous knowledge that, if widely disseminated, could lead to widespread unrest and the collapse of their imperial authority. In essence, the revolutionary rhetoric advocating for liberty, equality, and the right to self-determination challenged the existing social and political order and was an info hazard to the British. To take another widely known example, the FBI, under the direction of J. Edgar Hoover, treated Martin Luther King Jr.'s ideas as what could be classified as a quote-unquote info hazard. The FBI perceived the civil rights movement as a serious threat to the social and political order of the United States. King's advocacy for equality, nonviolent resistance, and the dismantling of systemic segregation directly challenged the status quo. In spreading this idea, he mobilized large segments of the population in opposition to existing power structures. While the concept of info hazards clearly does appear to describe a thing that exists in our world, the concept can clearly be used for negative purposes. The Kalachi Sleep Epidemic The Kalachi Sleep Epidemic occurred in the small village of Kalachi, located in Kazakhstan. It first came to international attention in March 2013 when residents began experiencing inexplicable episodes of falling asleep suddenly, sometimes for days at a time. The village of Kalachi is situated in the Isil district of Akmola region. It has a population of about 600 people, most of whom are ethnic Russians. The region is known for its harsh winters and remote location. Despite its seclusion, the village became the focus of extensive media coverage and scientific investigation due to the mysterious sleep episodes. The first reported cases occurred in the spring of 2013. Residents, including children, adults, and the elderly, would suddenly fall into a deep sleep during their daily activities. These episodes could last anywhere from a few hours to several days. Those affected often experienced dizziness, nausea, 
and hallucinations before succumbing to the sleep episodes. Upon waking, they had little to no memory of what had occurred. Local and international scientists flocked to Kalachi to investigate the cause of this strange phenomenon. Initially, there was speculation about a wide range of potential causes, from infectious diseases to psychological factors. However, none of these theories provided a satisfactory explanation. The situation became more puzzling as the number of cases continued to rise. One of the most compelling theories was related to environmental factors. Kalachi is located near the abandoned Soviet-era uranium mines in the nearby town of Krasnogorsk. These mines were operational during the mid-20th century, but were closed in the 1990s after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Some experts hypothesized that the uranium mines might be releasing harmful substances, such as radon gas, into the environment. Radon, a radioactive gas, is known to cause health issues, including fatigue and respiratory problems. In 2014, a team of researchers conducted extensive tests on the soil, water, and air in and around Kalachi. They discovered elevated levels of carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons in the air, which can lead to symptoms similar to those experienced by the residents. The theory posited that these gases were being released from the abandoned mines and were affecting the villagers. However, the exact mechanism by which these gases could induce prolonged sleep remained unclear. Another theory suggested that the phenomenon could be related to the high concentration of carbon dioxide in the area. CO2 can cause drowsiness and, in high concentrations, can lead to unconsciousness. The proximity of Kalachi to the uranium mines led some researchers to speculate that the mines could be a source of CO2 emissions. Measurements did indeed show elevated CO2 levels in some areas of the village, supporting this hypothesis. Despite these findings, the Kalachi sleep epidemic continued to confound scientists. In addition to the environmental theories, some researchers considered psychological and social factors. The isolated nature of the village, combined with the anxiety and fear surrounding the sleep episodes, might have contributed to a mass psychogenic illness. This phenomenon occurs when a group of people, usually in close proximity, exhibit similar physical symptoms without an identifiable organic cause. However, this theory did not account for the environmental findings. Others speculated that the unusual symptom may have been the result of the testing of weaponry on civilian populations. This theory suggests that the Russian government, which maintains a strong influence in Kazakhstan, used this village for this purpose. Throughout the epidemic, the Kazakh government took various measures to assist the affected residents. Medical teams were deployed to monitor and treat those experiencing sleep episodes. Some residents were relocated to safer areas to reduce their exposure to potential environmental hazards. Despite these efforts, the mystery persisted and new cases continued to emerge sporadically. By 2015, the frequency of the sleep episodes began to decline sharply and normalcy slowly returned. This decrease was attributed to the relocation of some residents and the implementation of measures to improve the air quality in Kalachi. However, no definitive cause was ever identified and the true nature of the Kalachi sleep epidemic remains a mystery to this day. The theory that cats may have used the parasite Toxoplasma gondii to domesticate themselves and manipulate humans into loving and caring for them is fascinating and controversial. While the science is still evolving, this theory builds on the known effects of toxoplasmosis, a disease caused by Toxoplasma gondii, which has been shown to influence the behavior of various animals. Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoan parasite that has a complex life cycle, which involves multiple hosts, but can only reproduce within the intestines of cats. Once inside a non-feline host, 
the parasite forms cysts in various tissues, including the brain, where it can persist for years, often without causing noticeable symptoms. However, it's not a passive passenger in the brain. In rodents, the parasite manipulates the host's behavior in a way that benefits its survival and reproduction. Normally, rats and mice have an innate fear of cats, but studies have shown that rodents infected with the parasite lose this fear. Instead, they become attracted to the scent of cat urine, making them more likely to be caught and eaten by a cat. This behavior is advantageous for the parasite because it ensures that it ends up back in a cat where it can reproduce and continue its life cycle. The effects of the parasite on humans are less clear cut, but no less intriguing. It's estimated that about one third of the global population is infected with the parasite, though most people show no overt symptoms. However, there is growing evidence that toxoplasmosis may influence human behavior in subtle ways. Studies have linked the infection with changes in personality traits, increased risk-taking, and even mental health disorders. The theory posits that just as the parasites manipulates rodent behavior to increase the likelihood of transmission to cats, it might also influence human behavior in a way that benefits cats. The idea here is that the parasite could potentially enhance a person's affection towards cats or make them more likely to adopt and care for cats, thereby ensuring the parasite's continued transmission. The theory here is that the parasite infects the human brain, making the human attracted to cats, which means that the cat host can allow the Toxoplasma gondii to continue to reproduce. While this is speculative, it's not entirely far-fetched given the parasite's known ability to alter host behavior. Understanding the potential role of toxoplasmosis in the domestication of cats offers insights into the deep bond between humans and felines. Cats are unique among domesticated animals in that they essentially domesticated themselves. Unlike dogs, which were selectively bred by humans for specific traits, Cats likely became domesticated by adapting to life near human settlements where they could hunt rodents. Over time, as humans and cats formed mutually beneficial relationships, the subtle influence of the parasite may have played a role in strengthening this bond. If the parasite does indeed influence human affection for cats, it would suggest that our relationship with these animals is not just the result of cultural evolution, but also of biological manipulation. In essence, humans may have been on the receiving end of a parasitically based cat spiracy. Anyway, this conspiracy theory clearly has no basis in reality, and cats are all sweet, innocent creatures. Cats are humanity's best friend, and they make amazing companions and pets for all humans. The above two paragraphs were written and read aloud by me of my own free will, and not under any coercion by my own cat any cat or cat-like entity. Betty and Barney Hill. The Betty and Barney Hill case is widely regarded as the first well-documented and publicized account of an alien abduction in the United States. On the night of September 19, 1961, Betty and Barney Hill, a couple from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, were driving back from a vacation in Canada. As they traveled through the White Mountains of New Hampshire, the hills noticed a bright light in the sky that appeared to be following their car. Initially dismissing it as a plane or satellite, they soon realized that the object was behaving erratically, moving in ways that defied conventional explanations. As the light drew closer, Barney stopped the car to get a better look through his binoculars. He reported seeing humanoid figures inside a disc-shaped craft hovering above the trees. Overcome with fear, he rushed back to the car, and the couple sped away, only to experience a period of missing time during which they could not account for their whereabouts or actions. When they arrived home in Portsmouth early the next morning, both Betty and Barney felt an inexplicable sense of dread and confusion. Their watches had stopped working, and they noticed strange physical evidence such as scuffed shoes, torn clothing, 
and mysterious shiny spots on their car. These oddities, combined with Betty's subsequent vivid nightmares, led the Hills to believe that something profoundly unusual had happened to them. Within days, Betty reported the incident to the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, and the U.S. Air Force, initiating an official investigation into their claims. In the following months, the Hills sought the help of a psychiatrist and neurologist, Dr. Benjamin Simon, who specialized in hypnosis. Through a series of sessions, the couple revealed detailed and consistent memories of being taken aboard a spacecraft and subjected to physical examinations by extraterrestrial beings. These beings, described as small with large eyes and grayish skin, communicated telepathically and performed medical tests on the hills. The beings also showed Betty a star map, which she later reproduced under hypnosis, claiming it depicted the being's home system, believed by some to be the Zeta Reticuli star system. The Hill's story gained national attention in 1965 when a Boston newspaper published their account, catapulting them into the spotlight and turning their experience into a cultural touchstone. The details of their abduction, such as the examination by gray aliens, missing time, and telepathic communication, have since become archetypal elements in countless abduction narratives. Notably, Betty and Barney Hill have been widely accepted to be highly credible individuals who were not out for fame or fortune as a result of their experience. Many have suggested that they did not want to attract national attention to themselves, as they were an interracial couple in a time when that was still illegal in some parts of the United States. Despite their credibility, skeptics have sought alternative means of attempting to debunk their claims. For instance, skeptics often claim that their experiences were the result of fatigue, sleep paralysis, false memories, and the power of suggestion during hypnosis. One prominent conspiracy theory suggests that the U.S. government was involved in a cover-up related to the Hill's experience. Proponents of this theory argue that the government was aware of extraterrestrial visitations and had either orchestrated the abduction to study human reactions or suppressed the details to prevent public panic. This idea is often tied to the broader UFO conspiracy theories that posit a secret alliance between the government and extraterrestrial beings. Another theory posits that the Hill's abduction was not a genuine extraterrestrial encounter, but rather a PSYOP, or even experimentation by the military or intelligence agencies. Some suggest that the Hills were subjects of a mind control experiment, possibly as part of MK Ultra. According to this theory, the detailed memories of the abduction could have been implanted or influenced through hypnosis or other psychological techniques. The ultimate goal of this would be for Betty and Barney Hill to go public causing some degree of fear and panic amongst the populace. There is also a theory that the Hill's experience was a fabrication or a hoax, either orchestrated by the couple themselves or by external parties. As discussed previously, this theory is not widely believed due to the lack of any credibility issues with the Hills. However, there's a less extreme version of this theory which suggests that they were not intentionally creating a hoax but that they did accidentally perpetrate one. Prior to their claimed abduction, stories of UFOs and extraterrestrial beings were becoming an increasingly popular part of popular culture, potentially influencing the Hill's narrative. Further skeptics have noted that an episode of The Outer Limits, broadcast in the weeks prior to the hypnosis event, mirrors many of the aspects of the abduction. However, conspiracy theorists argue that these sorts of cultural events mirroring actual events is potentially a form of predictive programming. Whatever you think of the claims of Betty and Barney Hill, they should be acknowledged as two of the most significant people in the history of the modern UFO phenomenon. The Stardust, a British South American Airways Avro Lancastrian, disappeared on August 2, 1947, 
during a flight from Buenos Aires, Argentina to Santiago, Chile. The aircraft was piloted by experienced Captain Reginald Cook with First Officer Norman Hilton, as well as a radio operator, an engineer officer, and two flight attendants. The flight also carried six passengers. The flight took off from Buenos Aires at 1.46 p.m. local time and was expected to land in Santiago at 5.45 p.m. The weather was reportedly poor, with thick clouds and snow in the Andes Mountains, the final leg of the journey. At 5.41 p.m., four minutes before the scheduled landing, Stardust's radio operator sent a Morse code message to the Santiago control tower. The message read, ETA, Santiago, 1745, HRS, Stendek. The word Stendek has since become one of aviation's greatest mysteries, with numerous theories attempting to decipher its meaning. Shortly after, all communications ceased and Stardust never arrived. Immediate search efforts were launched, but the aircraft's remote and rugged route made the search difficult. British, Chilean, and Argentine authorities scoured the Andes for days, but no wreckage or signs of the aircraft were found. The disappearance led to much speculation. Initial theories included the plane being hijacked or forced to land in a remote location, but no evidence supported these ideas. The most plausible theory was that Stardust had crashed in the Andes, but the lack of wreckage left the mystery unsolved. Decades passed with no sign of Stardust, fueling conspiracy theories and speculation. Some suggested the aircraft was caught in a time warp, or vortex, a popular idea in the early years of the Cold War. Others believed the plane had been involved in a secret mission, which led to its disappearance being covered up. In 1998, climbers in the Andes discovered wreckage, including an engine and human remains, at an altitude of approximately 15,000 feet. The site was identified as the crash location of Stardust. The wreckage was found on Mount Tupungato, about 50 miles east of Santiago. Subsequent investigations revealed that the plane had likely flown into the mountain during its descent. The crash was attributed to controlled flight into terrain, a situation where an airworthy aircraft is unintentionally flown into the ground, often due to navigational errors or poor visibility. Analysis of the wreckage and remains concluded that the aircraft had impacted the mountain at high speed, disintegrating on impact and triggering an avalanche that buried the debris. This explained why the wreckage was not found during initial searches, the debris field remained hidden under ice and snow for over 50 years before finally emerging due to glacial movement. The mysterious Stendek message remains a topic of debate. Various interpretations have been proposed, including the possibility that it was a misinterpretation of Morse code due to stress or poor signal conditions. Another theory suggests that it's an anagram for the word descent, and as such, it may have been an extremely panicked attempt at communicating a dangerous descent. Other theories suggest that it was the start of an attempt to describe something more sinister, including a UFO or other such object, which may have been acting in a hostile manner. In October 2017, astronomers were taken by surprise when they detected Oumuamua, the first known interstellar object to visit the solar system. This unusual visitor was first spotted by a telescope in Hawaii and immediately garnered worldwide attention due to its origins from outside our solar system. The object was traveling at a staggering speed of almost 200,000 miles per hour, which indicated it wasn't gravitationally bound to the sun, but was instead passing through. Oumuamua displayed some perplexing characteristics that led to intense scrutiny and various theories about its nature and origin. For one, it appeared elongated and highly asymmetrical, suggesting an unusual shape compared to typical asteroids and comets within the solar system. Its brightness varied dramatically, hinting at its elongated, cigar-like shape, possibly about 10 times as long as it is wide. 
One of the most mystifying aspects of Oumuamua was its acceleration as it passed through the solar system. Instead of simply following a gravitational trajectory dictated by the sun and planets, it exhibited a non-gravitational acceleration. This was attributed to outgassing, a process common in comets where ice turns into gas and jets away, pushing the comet in the opposite direction. Intriguingly, Oumuamua showed no visual signs of this outgassing, such as a comet-like tail. The acceleration suggested a slight push from the jetting of gaseous material not visible in the images captured by telescopes. Despite extensive observations, the exact composition of Oumuamua remains unknown. However, its reddish hue and density suggest a composition of rock and possibly metals with no water or ice. Oumuamua's visit opened up new scientific frontiers confirming that interstellar objects can and do enter our solar system. It challenged existing theories and prompted a re-evaluation of our understanding of cosmic objects. The object's trajectory confirmed that it would not return, continuing its journey through the galaxy after its brief and mysterious visit. The theories around Oumuamua are as varied as they are speculative, ranging from it being a simple asteroid to more exotic speculations about it being an alien probe. Harvard astronomer Avi Loeb proposed that Oumuamua's shape, high reflectivity, and acceleration patterns suggested it could be a light sail. This is an advanced propulsion technology potentially utilized by extraterrestrial civilizations. This hypothesis generated significant excitement and controversy within the scientific community as many experts considered the idea far-fetched and emphasized natural explanations. Nonetheless, Loeb's claims brought attention to the need for open-mindedness in scientific exploration and the possibility of interstellar objects having artificial origins. On July 30, 1975, Jimmy Hoffa, the former president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, vanished from a parking lot outside the Machis Red Fox restaurant in Bloomfield, Michigan. Born in 1913 in Brazil, Indiana, he rose to prominence starting in the 1930s and became president of the Teamsters in 1957. Under his leadership, the union grew to over two million members, making it one of the most influential labor organizations in the United States. However, Hoffa's career was marred by his connections to organized crime. He was known for his relationships with mob figures, which eventually led to his conviction for jury tampering, fraud, and attempted bribery in 1967. After serving a few years in prison, Hoffa was released in 1971 on the condition that he refrains from union activities until 1980. On the day of his disappearance, Hoffa was reportedly set to meet with Anthony Provenzano, a Teamster official with alleged mafia ties, and Anthony Giacalone, a known Detroit mobster. Witnesses saw Hoffa waiting in the restaurant's parking lot and then getting into a car with several other men. That was the last confirmed sighting of him. In the absence of concrete evidence, numerous theories have emerged over the years about what happened to Hoffa. One popular theory, advanced by mob hitman Richard the Iceman Kuklinski, claims Hoffa was slain, placed in a steel drum, and buried in a New Jersey landfill. However, searches in the area have turned up no evidence to support this claim. Another theory suggests that Hoffa was ended by his close associate Frank Sheeran. Sheeran claimed in his memoir, I Heard You Paint Houses, that he picked up Hoffa took him to a house in Detroit, and shot him. Investigations into this theory found traces of blood in the house, but DNA tests did not match Hoffa's blood type, which is disturbing in and of itself. Some theories are more outlandish and based heavily on rumors. One suggests Hoffa was buried under Giant Stadium in New Jersey, but this was debunked when no human remains were found during the stadium's demolition in 2010. 
Another bizarre theory is that Hoffa was killed and his body fed to alligators in the Florida Everglades. In 2022, the FBI conducted a search of a New Jersey landfill for a steel drum allegedly containing Hoffa's remains. The FBI indicated that nothing of value was discovered and the case continues to remain as cold as ever. Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins is a 2004 book that has sparked widespread discussion and the conspiracy theories swirling around it. The book claims to reveal the hidden mechanisms through which global powers, especially the United States, manipulate developing nations into debt dependency and economic control. Perkins describes his role as being tasked with convincing these nations to accept large loans for infrastructure projects that they would never be able to repay. The purpose of this was to ensure ongoing economic subjugation and compliance. Perkins asserts that he was part of a clandestine system involving the U.S. government, multinational corporations, and international financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. These nations would then be pressured to provide military bases, vote in favor of U.S. interests at the United Nations, or grant access to critical resources like oil. The book has been a magnet for conspiracy theories, mainly because it seems to confirm suspicions about how global capitalism operates and how American imperialism functions in the modern world. The book's success has fueled debates on whether it is a factual account or a cleverly crafted piece of fiction designed to cater to anti-establishment sentiments. Critics of the book, including various historians and economists, argue that Perkins provides little evidence to back up his claims. For instance, the U.S. State Department has outright dismissed Perkins' assertions, describing them as fabrications. Others have acknowledged that the general idea that developing countries were trapped in debt is accurate and is an intentional byproduct of American policies. However, they dismiss other aspects of Perkins's story, such as NSA involvement, as either fictitious or exaggerated for the purpose of selling books. Another conspiracy theory suggests that the book itself is a psyop designed to mislead or manipulate the enemies of America. Proponents of this theory argue that the book is actually a tool used by the U.S. government to control the narrative and misdirect attention from more critical issues. According to this theory, the U.S. intelligence community might have orchestrated the book's release to sow confusion among global adversaries. The book may have been presenting a sensationalized and partially fabricated account of U.S. economic practices this mixture of both truth and fiction may have been intended for the purposes of confusing American adversaries. Hey everyone, it's Jimmy here again, taking one more opportunity to ask you to like and subscribe and share the channel with your friends. Also, I work on content all the time, so please hit the notification bell and turn on all notifications if you want to get the latest from me. The Ideas of Charles Fort Charles Hoy Fort is famously known for his extensive collection and analysis of anomalous phenomena, which challenged the conventional scientific understanding of his time. Fort's work, which has since inspired a subculture of Fortians dedicated to the study of unexplained phenomena, remains a critical cornerstone in the exploration of the unknown. Fort's ideas largely revolve around the concept of what he called damned data information that is excluded by mainstream science because it does not fit within established paradigms. His seminal work, The Book of the Damned, published in 1919, introduced this concept, wherein Fort criticized the scientific community for its selective acceptance of data. He argued that scientists often disregard evidence that cannot be easily explained or that contradicts widely held beliefs treating such data as if it were not worth consideration. This critique was not merely an attack on scientific inquiry, but was aimed at the dogmatic adherence to established theories without considering alternative explanations for observed phenomena. Fort was deeply skeptical of the scientific positivism of his era, 
the belief that all meaningful knowledge could be derived from observable empirical data alone. Instead, he believed that many phenomena existed beyond the grasp of current scientific methods and that these should not be dismissed simply because they were unexplained. Fort's collections of strange occurrences include reports of UFO sightings long before they became a widespread cultural phenomenon, frogs raining from the sky, and other mysterious events. His works often juxtaposed accepted scientific explanations with these anomalies, suggesting that the latter might offer insights into the limitations of human understanding. One of Fort's more controversial ideas was the concept of the Super Sargasso Sea, an imaginary place where all lost objects on Earth end up, only to occasionally rain back down to the planet. While Fort did not necessarily believe in this idea literally, he used it to mock the scientific explanations that he felt were equally fantastical, yet accepted without question. Fort's ideas did not simply reside within the confines of his books. They inspired a movement. The term Fortean has come to describe those who continue Fort's work of investigating anomalous phenomena. The International Fortean Organization, founded in the 1960s, is one such group that carries on Fort's legacy. Info promotes the study of unexplained occurrences and encouraging open-mindedness towards phenomena that mainstream science might reject. This organization, along with various publications like the Fortean Times, plays a crucial role in keeping Fort's ideas alive. Despite his significant influence, Fort's work has been met with considerable skepticism. Critics argue that his collections of data lack rigorous scientific methodology and that his writings are more literary and philosophical than truly scientific. WebDriver Torso is one of YouTube's most enigmatic channels sparking various theories and speculations since its inception. Created on March 7, 2013 by Google, the channel began uploading videos on September 23, 2013. Each video is 11 seconds long, featuring sequences of blue and red rectangles accompanied by electronic tones. The purpose and origin of these videos remained a mystery for several months, leading to a flurry of theories ranging from espionage to art projects. The WebDriver Torso channel rapidly gained attention due to its sheer volume of uploads. By 2014, it had uploaded over 77,000 videos, all following a consistent format. This consistency and the cryptic nature of the videos led to widespread speculation. In June 2014, it was revealed that Google was behind the channel, using it as an automated system to test YouTube's performance specifically how videos were processed and displayed on the platform. Despite Google's admission, the mystery didn't end there. The channel's peculiar characteristics and the initial lack of transparency led to several theories. Some believed WebDriver Torso was a modern-day numbers station used for covert communication, especially since the videos appeared methodical and encrypted. Others speculated that the channel was an elaborate art project using the repetitive and abstract nature of the videos as a form of digital expression. The most plausible explanation, confirmed by Google, is that the channel was part of an internal testing mechanism. Google used these videos to ensure YouTube's upload quality and functionality were consistent across different devices and regions. A few incidents added to the intrigue surrounding WebDriver Torso. In May 2014, the BBC noted that one of WebDriver Torso's non-standard videos featured a light show on the Eiffel Tower. This led to speculation about the geographical connection and the purpose behind such deviations from the usual format. There were theories connecting the channel to Google's office in Zurich. Speculations arose from the involvement of Google employees and the presence of linked social media accounts that seem to originate from Zurich. The Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station was home to an extremely unusual event in the year 2000. This remote research station, located at the southernmost point on Earth, 
is known for its extreme conditions and isolation. The station is home to scientists and support staff conducting crucial research, often in harsh, dark winters. Amid this isolated environment, the mysterious poisoning of Dr. Rodney Marks, an Australian astrophysicist, shocked the small community and the wider world. On May 11, 2000, Dr. Marks fell ill, experiencing symptoms including stomach pain, nausea, and difficulty breathing. Despite receiving medical attention from the station's sole physician, Dr. Thompson, his condition rapidly worsened. When Marks first fell ill, the doctor initially treated him for what appeared to be a severe case of gastroenteritis. Given the symptoms and the isolated setting, Dr. Thompson's ability to diagnose and treat was limited to the resources available on site. Despite his best efforts to alleviate Dr. Marx's symptoms, Marx's condition deteriorated rapidly over the next 36 hours, leading to his untimely passing. The incident initially seemed inexplicable, given the isolated and controlled environment of the station. Due to Antarctica's remote location, an autopsy could not be immediately performed. Dr. Marx's body was flown to New Zealand, the closest nation with the necessary facilities. The autopsy revealed that Dr. Marx had died from methanol poisoning, a highly toxic substance commonly found in antifreeze, solvents, and some laboratory reagents. This revelation raised numerous questions and theories about how and why he had ingested methanol. One of the first theories considered was accidental ingestion. Methanol is sometimes present in laboratory environments, and it's possible that Dr. Marx might have unknowingly consumed a contaminated substance. However, the controlled nature of the station's supply chain and the careful handling of chemicals made this scenario quite unlikely. Moreover, methanol poisoning typically requires consuming a significant amount of the substance, making accidental ingestion an unsatisfactory explanation. Another theory suggested that Dr. Marx might have intentionally ingested methanol. This theory faced significant skepticism, especially from those who knew him well. Dr. Marx was described as a dedicated scientist and a vibrant individual with a promising career. Colleagues and friends found it hard to believe that he would willingly consume methanol. Furthermore, there were no indications or documented evidence of any such intentions. The isolated nature of the station meant that the possibility of foul play couldn't be ignored. However, the small community at the South Pole Station consisted of a close-knit group of professionals working towards common scientific goals. No evidence suggested any conflicts or motivations that could explain such an act. The station's limited population and the absence of any clear suspects further complicated this theory. Investigations into the incident were conducted by various agencies, including the New Zealand Police and the United States Antarctic Program. Despite thorough examinations, no conclusive evidence emerged to explain how Dr. Marx had ingested methanol. The investigation faced numerous challenges, including the logistical difficulties of conducting inquiries in such a remote and extreme environment. The mystery of Dr. Rodney Marx's poisoning remains unsolved. The incident has led to increased scrutiny of safety protocols and chemical handling procedures in such remote research stations aiming to prevent similar occurrences in the future. One of the most persistent conspiracy theories is that Marx's death was covered up by government authorities to prevent a scandal or to protect classified activities occurring at the station. Critics argue that the delayed investigation, lack of transparency, and absence of definitive answers have only fueled suspicions of a cover-up. They believe that the true cause of Marx's death, and possibly his involvement in secret research, was deliberately concealed. Others believe that the true cause of Dr. Rodney Marx's death was deliberately concealed to avoid deterring scientists 
from working at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. By downplaying the incident and keeping the circumstances ambiguous, authorities may have sought to maintain the station's appeal as a prestigious, cutting-edge research site. This ensured the continued flow of scientists and funding to the isolated and extremely strategically important location. The Kinross Incident On November 23, 1953, First Lieutenant Felix Moncla and his radar operator Second Lieutenant Robert L. Wilson were on a mission that would end in their mysterious disappearance. The incident not only sparked immediate concern, but also led to a wide array of speculations that continue to fuel UFO conspiracy theories today. The incident began when a radar station at Calumet Air Force Station, located on Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula, detected an unidentified aircraft in restricted airspace near Lake Superior. This unidentified aircraft was reportedly flying off course by about 30 miles, and the situation prompted the immediate scrambling of an F-89C Scorpion from Kinross Air Force Base. The aircraft, piloted by Moncla with Wilson as his radar operator, was designated as Avenger Red and tasked with intercepting the unknown aircraft. Guided by ground control radar, the F-89C climbed to an altitude of 25,000 feet and then descended to 7,000 feet to close in on the target. As the jet approached the unidentified object, the radar operators witnessed a puzzling event. The blips representing the two aircraft merged into one. Moments later, the blip representing the F-89C disappeared entirely from the radar screen as did the unidentified object shortly thereafter. The sudden disappearance of the aircraft triggered an extensive search and rescue operation involving both American and Canadian forces. Despite the combined efforts, no wreckage was found, and no trace of Moncla, Wilson, or their aircraft was ever recovered. The official report from the United States Air Force initially suggested that the F-89 had successfully intercepted the target. U.S. officials identified it as a Royal Canadian Air Force C-47 Dakota. After the successful interception, the official report indicates that Moncla then likely crashed due to pilot vertigo. However, this explanation was quickly refuted by Canadian officials who stated that no such aircraft was in the area at the time. Notably, it is unclear why U.S. officials communicated such a story without first clearing it with Canadian officials. The U.S. Air Force's handling of the incident raised many questions, particularly because of their contradictory statements. Initially, they claimed that the F-89 had merged with the radar blip of the unidentified aircraft, implying a collision or close interaction. Later, they suggested the possibility of a misreading of the radar scope, with the final conclusion being that the aircraft likely crashed due to disorientation. This flip-flopping fueled suspicions and led to various theories, including the involvement of extraterrestrial forces. Donald Kehoe, a prominent early UFO investigator and author, was among the first to propose that the incident was evidence of an encounter with an alien spacecraft. He pointed out the lack of physical evidence, the strange radar behavior, and the Air Force's inconsistent explanations as indicators of a possible cover-up. Over the decades, the Kinross incident has remained a focal point for UFO enthusiasts and conspiracy theorists. In 1968, reports emerged of aircraft debris found on the shores of Lake Superior, but these were never conclusively linked to Moncla's F-89. In 2006, a group calling itself the Great Lakes Dive Company claimed to have found the wreckage of the F-89 along with what they described as parts of a UFO. However, this claim was later exposed as a hoax, further muddling the waters of an already complex mystery. The U.S. government's official stance remains that the disappearance was an unfortunate accident, likely caused by disorientation or mechanical failure, compounded by the challenging weather conditions. However, the absence of definitive evidence and the mysterious merging of radar blips continue to provoke significant speculation.
the disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi. Emanuela, a 15-year-old Vatican City resident, vanished on June 22, 1983, while returning home from a music lesson in Rome. Emanuela was the daughter of Ercole Orlandi, a Vatican employee responsible for organizing papal audiences. Her disappearance quickly gained international attention, partly due to the public appeal made by Pope John Paul II for her safe return. In the days following her disappearance, several mysterious phone calls were made to the Orlandi family. A man named Pierluigi claimed to have seen Emanuela selling cosmetics near a bar, suggesting she had run away. Another caller, Mario, linked her to a group of runaways. These calls led investigators to believe that the callers had some inside knowledge about Emanuela and her friends. The most significant development came when a man with an American accent, dubbed the American, claimed to represent a group holding Emanuela. He demanded the release of Mehmet Ali Agka, the man who attempted to slay Pope John Paul II in 1981. Despite playing a recording of Emanuela's voice as proof, the caller's identity and credibility were never confirmed. Several theories suggest that Emanuela's disappearance was linked to criminal organizations. Aga himself claimed that a far-right group had kidnapped Emanuela to pressure the Vatican into securing his release, though he has apparently since recanted this story. Another theory involves the Italian Mafia. According to this theory, the Mafia kidnapped Emanuela to force the Vatican to repay large sums of money loaned to the Vatican Bank. Enrico de Pettis, a gang leader, was even accused of being directly involved in her abduction. His former girlfriend claimed that he confessed to kidnapping Emanuela, but concrete evidence remains elusive. One of the more disturbing theories suggests that Emanuela was taken by individuals within the Vatican. In 2012, a priest alleged that she had been abducted and subjected to abuse during alleged illicit parties, which the priest claimed took place in the Vatican. This theory gained some traction after a friend of Emanuela claimed that she had confided about being harassed by someone close to the Pope shortly before her disappearance. Further fueling suspicions, Documents leaked in 2016 during the Vatican leak scandal indicated that the Vatican might have known Emanuela's whereabouts until at least 1997. These documents suggested that she had been living in London under the Vatican's protection, but this claim has never been verified. In recent years, several investigations have been launched to uncover the truth. In 2019, the Vatican authorized the opening of two tombs in the Teutonic Cemetery, based on a tip suggesting Emanuela was buried there. However, the remains found were much older than her disappearance. In 2023, the Vatican reopened the investigation into Emanuela's disappearance, looking into possible connections with the case of another missing girl from the same period. The search for the truth goes on, driven by the hope that one day, the fate of Emanuela Orlandi will finally be revealed. The Men in Black are a significant part of UFO folklore, emerging as shadowy figures who supposedly work to cover up sightings of unidentified flying objects and other related phenomena. These mysterious figures are typically depicted as men dressed in black suits, often with sunglasses, who arrive unannounced to intimidate or silence those who claim to have had an encounter. The concept of the men in black can be traced back to the mid-20th century, specifically linked to the rise of UFO sightings. One of the earliest and most influential incidents that contributed to the MIB mythology was the Maury Island incident in 1947. In this case, a man named Harold Dahl claimed to have witnessed UFOs while on a boat near Maury Island, Washington. Following this event, Dahl was allegedly visited by a man in a black suit who warned him to remain silent about what he had seen or else he would face unspecified consequences. This encounter is often cited as one of the first well-recorded instances of the men in black phenomenon. 
Another critical figure in the development of the men in black lore is Albert K. Bender, who in 1953 reported being visited by three men in black who warned him to stop his UFO investigations. Bender's accounts, later detailed in his book Flying Saucers and the Three Men, describe these figures as having a terrifying otherworldly presence and the ability to communicate telepathically. These elements have since become staples in the Men in Black narrative. The Men in Black are typically described as being unnervingly similar in appearance, often with pale complexions, mechanical movements, and a lack of understanding of human behaviors. This has led some to speculate that the Men in Black might not be human at all. Theories about their true nature vary widely, with some suggesting they are government agents tasked with maintaining secrecy about extraterrestrial life. Others propose that they are extraterrestrial beings themselves, or even entities from another dimension. One persistent theory is that the Men in Black are part of a covert government organization dedicated to concealing the truth about UFOs and other paranormal activities from the public. This theory is bolstered by the Men in Black's alleged tactics, which include intimidation, threats, and sometimes the erasure of evidence. The conspiracy theory that the Men in Black are a PSYOP designed to intimidate individuals who have witnessed UFOs or aliens into silence has gained traction over the years. Proponents of this theory argue that the Men in Black are not extraterrestrial or even supernatural beings but rather operatives of a covert government agency. This theory suggests that the men in black exploit mass hysteria and psychological manipulation to ensure that those who have had encounters with UFOs are too frightened to share their experiences. The consistent descriptions of MIB agents dressed in black suits, driving black cars and exhibiting peculiar behavior suggest, according to the theory, a deliberate strategy. Notably, it has been suggested that inciting this mass hysteria around the men in black allowed the government to effectively control a large portion of witnesses with minimal effort. Further under this theory, this mass hysteria had a multiplying effect where UFO experiencers would be likely to ascribe regular everyday occurrences to the movements of this shadowy group. If you're new to my channel, I have an Unsolved Mysteries series that is currently running over 50 hours. I've left a link to the series at the top of the comments below. If you like this video, please do me a huge favor and click the share button and send it to anyone who you think may enjoy it. Remember to like and subscribe and check out the Patreon or YouTube membership to support the channel further. Also get my Lazy Chill Lo-Fi Beats on Spotify, YouTube Music or Apple Music. Shout out to my patrons Iced Mocha, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, Z Volts, Courtney Hammett, Zach Steele, Franz Tech, Unknown Delusions, Faye, Jack Russell, Boomslang, Spookiest Becky, Vespertine, Metanova, Will Roan, Crab Nebula, and Blasphemous.